we gather in worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. At this sad time for our nation and the Commonwealth, we at St. James King Street express our affection and gratitude as we mourn the death of our late Sovereign. Her Majesty the Queen has not only served the United Kingdom, Australia, and the entire Commonwealth of Nations with great distinction throughout an outstandingly long reign. She has been a particular inspiration to people of faith through her personal commitment to God and the way this has shaped her life of service. Through her seven decades on the throne, the Queen has lived through a period of enormous change and together with her family has provided a sense of security, continuity and unity across so many nations. She, together with her children, grandchildren and great-children, great-grandchildren, hold a special place in the affections of us all at this time of sadness. As we honour the memory of Her Majesty and give thanks for her reign, we extend our condolences to our new Sovereign and to all members of the Royal Family and assure them of our prayers. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Lord our God, lover of souls. You uphold us in life and sustain us in death. To you be glory and praise forever. For the darkness of this age is passing away as Christ, the bright and morning star, brings to his saints the light of life. As you give light to those in darkness who walk in the shadow of death, so remember in your kingdom your faithful servant Elizabeth, that death may be for her the gate to life and to unending fellowship with you, where with your saints you live and reign, one in the perfect union of love, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord God, you provide for your people by your power and rule over them in love. Grant to your servant Charles, our King, the spirit of wisdom and discernment that being devoted to you with his whole heart, he may so wisely govern that in his time we may live in safety and in peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus said, This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, confident in God's forgiveness. Merciful God, our, our Maker and our Judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and indeed, deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ, our Lord.
Oh God, you are rich in love for your people. Show us the treasure that endures. And when we are tempted by greed, call us back into your service and make us worthy to be entrusted with the wealth that never fails. We ask this through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. My joy is gone. Grief is upon me. My heart is sick. Hark the cry of my poor people from far and wide in the land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their images, with their foreign idols? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of my poor people, I am hurt. I mourn, and dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of my poor people not been restored? Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears, so that I might weep day and night for the slain of my poor people. For the word of the Lord.
A reading from the first letter of Paul to Timothy. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions and thanksgivings shall be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, so that they may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God, our Saviour, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus himself, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. For this I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. A teacher to the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Also that the women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with their hair braided or with gold, pearls and expensive clothes, but with great works as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. For the word of the Lord.
Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Jesus said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give me an account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do? now that my master is taking the position away from me. I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do. When I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summonsing his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? He answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 50. Then he asked another, and how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. To the children of this age, uh, for the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation then are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal, their, the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. For the Gospel of the Lord. Let us come to God's word now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
We live in an age of social media and digital news content, an age of ever new technologies for connecting with people and with new ideas. We have access to a vast array of publication and chat platforms covering every conceivable topic, activity and interest. This is obviously a good thing and has expanded communication and connection. One of the ironies, however, is that we have lost the element of serendipity. With traditional media, such as newspapers, radio and TV, we would be exposed to a range of ideas and beliefs, often outside our personal comfort zone. We would sometimes stumble or drift into something new or unfamiliar, which would spark our interest or grab our attention. However, with digital media, we are, nud we are nudged by algorithms towards people and points of view that closely reflect our existing prejudices and preferences. It operates to keep us in our safe zone. In the modern context, we are not as often exposed to ideas or values different to our pre-existing positions. When it comes to our approach to scripture, we need to avoid a similar trend. The Bible can be a little overwhelming at times because of its sheer size and the extent of its different authors, doctrines, characters, stories and themes. If it was up to the parish priests and preachers to decide what Bible readings to use on Sunday, there's a risk of cherry-picking passages which best reflect the officiant's view of Christianity and to avoid those passages which don't so easily fit within the biblical framework. As Aaron pointed out to me after the earlier Mass this morning, an appropriate theme today would have been, let us run the race that is set before us, looking only unto Jesus. But the use of the lectionary in the Anglican Church helps ensure that we encounter the full witness of Scripture. With the lectionary, we get a steady diet of God's Word. By providing appointed readings for Sunday worship, it helps ensure that priests and preachers do not pick and choose pet or favourite texts and do not avoid difficult or less palatable passages. Today's lectionary passages are a good case in point. We have four readings that all present some challenge in terms of interpretation and relevance to modern Christian life. In the Old Testament reading today, we encounter the prophet Jeremiah in what seems to be a deep state of grief and sorrow over the sins and failings of God's people. To do that passage justice might benefit from insights into the psychology of the prophet's grief and sorrow. Today's psalm speaks in horrific detail about the cruelty inflicted on God's people by the nations around them. Today's epistle reading touches on two challenging issues that arise from constant misinterpretation of that chapter, the relationship of church and state and the role of women in church and society. And then you get to today's gospel reading. Here we have a parable of the dishonest or unjust manager. This is regarded as a notoriously difficult parable to interpret and to apply arguably the most difficult of all the parables. There are a bewildering number of explanations, most of which amount to guesswork or which are somewhat unconvincing. A moment ago I extolled the benefits that come from using the lectionary for our Sunday Eucharist. Uh, I have to admit though, in preparation for today's sermon, I inwardly grumbled a little bit, facing four passages that are not easy to grasp in terms of their place in our modern Christian journey. There is a common thread, however, across all four passages in that they speak to the realities of our existence as individuals and as a church in the midst of a society that does not share our allegiance to the King of Kings. What I propose to do is to look briefly at two of today's passages, the Gospel and Epistle readings. On first reading, the parable in today's Gospel is a curious passage. Is Jesus justifying or excusing the dishonest or unethical behaviour of the manager? Jesus taught almost half of his parables while travelling the countryside on his way to Jerusalem for his last Feast of Tabernacles. We encounter characters such as the Good Samaritan, 
the rich fool and the unjust judge. Added to that list is today's dishonest and unjust manager. The story begins, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. This manager handled the business affairs of the owner and apparently someone had reported his reckless squandering of his master's property. We can imagine that this rich man had many business holdings, including debts owed to him, probably by tenants of his properties. He sent word to his manager to prepare a report on how his businesses were going. This made the manager very nervous, for he feared he would lose his position when the master found out what he was doing. He said to himself, what will I do? now that my master is likely to take the position away from me. I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. He feared being destitute and at risk of death from disease or malnourishment. So the manager devised a plan to ensure he would not be left destitute. He decided to use his position of trust to negotiate some business deals for his own benefit. He offered to discount the debt, debts of his master's business partners in return for their friendship and possible generous future consideration for himself. They agreed, not surprisingly, for the discounts the manager was offering were up to 50%. Now comes the curious part of the parable. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly for the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. How do we make sense of the parable in light of his master's commendation? Why does the master praise this servant for what appears to be a dishonest act, and this all following the servant's earlier squandering of the master's assets? The text gives us no strong clues. Was the manager in his dealings with these debtors, giving away what really belonged to his master, or was he forgiving interest payments his master did not have the right to charge under the law of Moses? In Jesus' days, owners sometimes overcharged debtors, so the discounts the manager gave could have simply re returned the debts to their original amounts. This approach would have satisfied the rich man and gained the favour of the debtors. So what do we make of this parable? In verse 8, Jesus marks off two fields that operate in two different ways. The field of this age and the generation of the children of light. The manager, a child of this age, and his actions belong in a different field to the one occupied by the children of light. The praise of the children of this age for their shrewdness is an accusation against the children of light. The manager, as a child of this age, knew how to work the system to his best advantage. We, the children of light, need to learn equally well how to live wisely and shrewdly as citizens of the kingdom of God, people who are in the world but not of the world. Navigating our way in that dual context is no easy or light matter. And this then leads to the extraordinary statement by Jesus. Make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth. In light of what precedes that statement, it could be paraphrased as follows. Put yourself in a good position through your use of money and possessions, which so easily lead you astray, so that when this age is over, God will receive you into his eternal kingdom. As citizens of God's kingdom, do not hold back from learning from the attitudes of the children of this age, but only insofar as you do not compromise God's law and God's way. Use money wisely to advance God's kingdom. Why should the devil have all the good music? And then turning to today's epistle reading from 1 Timothy. This passage also touches on the relationship between the children of this age and the children of light. Paul urges that supplications, prayers, intercessions and thanksgivings be made for everyone, including for kings and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. 
Why does Paul encourage Timothy and the fledgling congregation in Ephesus to pray and give thanks for their political leaders? And what exactly should they ask from God? What should be the content and hoped for outcome of their supplications? What is meant by leading a quiet and peaceable life? It is instructive to consider the context of the community of believers to whom this letter was written before we then work out its implications for our day and age. The Jews were permitted to practice their own religion, unlike other Roman subjects. However, the new Christian community, who regularly shared in the breaking of bread, lived with the knowledge that if they would be discovered, they could face severe punishment, penal servitude for life, and possibly worse. Any Christian in that period knew that even if things were relatively peaceful, it was always possible that a suspicious government would crack down on them. The believers had another loyalty, which did not mean that they wished to overthrow the Roman administration, but that they would not comply with the state's demands in certain respects. They would not worship the emperor and refused to serve in the Roman army. They asked from the state what had been very reluctantly conceded to the Jews, exemption from the religious requirements of the empire. The early Christian community in turn was threatening and so simply bewildering to the Roman authorities. The Christian community was not revolutionary. It was not aiming to change the government. Its challenge to power was more serious. It would hold any government to account. It would test its integrity and it would give and withhold compliance accordingly. It was a community which set its own standards in the light of what had been given to them by an authority higher than the empire. The early Christians believed that if Jesus of Nazareth was Lord, no one else could be Lord over him, and therefore no one could override his authority. These Christians were quite happy to pray for the imperial state and even to pay taxes, but they could not grant the state their absolute undivided allegiance because they held another loyalty. This did not mean that they wished to overthrow the administration, but that they would not comply with the state's demands in every respect. And hence, St Paul in today's epistle could urge the readers to pray for kings and all in high positions. They would pray that these civil leaders would administer laws justly and wisely. They would pray that these leaders would not impose demands on the church, such as worship of the emperor, or other acts of idolatry. And they would pray that violence and cruelty would not be meted out to their members or to others in society. As Paul put it, pray that the believers could lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. And Paul was not, of course, urging anarchy and disobedience to earthly authority in all circumstances. Elsewhere in the New Testament, Paul teaches that learning to live with the powers that be is the appropriate mode of existence for the church. Believers should submit to courts and police. We should not speak and act as though we are above or outside all law and social restraint. As Tom Wright puts it, by being Christian, one has not thereby ceased to be human and that being human, one remains bound in ties and obligation to one's fellow humans and beyond that to the God who, as creator, has called his human creatures to live in harmony with each other. God wants human societies to be ordered. Being Christian does not release one from the complex obligations of this order, and one must therefore submit, at least in general, to those entrusted with enforcing this order. The institution of the crown in our system of constitutional monarchy is an interesting case study in the merging of the political sphere with the religious sphere. In the last 10 days, we have seen an extraordinary outpouring of public and private grief at the passing of our late monarch, Queen Elizabeth II. We have witnessed scenes involving ancient rituals and customs around the passing away of the Queen and the proclamation of our new King. These scenes bring into sharp focus the confluence of the religious and civic roles of the monarch. The monarch is supreme governor of the Church of England, having the title Defender of the Faith. 
For like Queen was herself a person of faith and loyalty to our God, she strived to live according to God's word. Tomorrow the world will join in mourning as we witness the funeral at Westminster Abbey, attended by the King and Queen Consort and by many world leaders. Many of us will join in offering thanks to God for the life and service of this extraordinary person and for all the qualities she displayed, and together we will mourn her passing. During her reign, we were able to lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. Reconciliation and justice for past colonial wrongs and for present wrongs have been and are being addressed for many throughout the Commonwealth, for which we also give thanks. May Queen Elizabeth rest in peace. Amen. Let us together affirm the faith of the Church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the world and for the church. Merciful God, your faithfulness to your people is everlasting and you answer your people when they cry to you. Receive our prayers for your world and your church. God, our companion, you entrust to our care the treasure of human relationships. Help us to be loyal and faithful to the families and friends you give to us so that we may live in love with one another and together create a community of care. Today we pray for the Episcopal Anglican Church of Brazil and on the 18th of each month we pray for St Lawrence House, 
for the young people, their carers and the board. We pray for those who do not know the joy of companionship, for those who are alone or estranged from families and friends, for those who are unnoticed, unwanted, unloved. Hear the cries of your poor people, O God, and in your mercy. God, our comforter, you entrust to our care the treasure of your little ones. Help us to be compassionate and faithful in our care for all who suffer and our own times of weakness. Help us to accept the care of others. We pray for those in need of consolation, comfort and hope. We pray for those who live in fear, anxiety or despair. We pray for the sad and the sorrowing, the sick and the dying. We pray today for the Reverend Peter Carman, Peter Jukes, Rosemary White, Cameron Kimber, Candice Waters, Ali Crawford, Katie Richardson, Johan Nels, Anne Ryan, Robin Karam, Enid and Brian, Mary Velling, Jan McIntyre, Sister Jeanette Fox, Colin Dunstan, Ruth Jones, and Francis Rolfe. And those in need, we pray for Nicholas Lee. And the recently departed, Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Tony Yulden, Doreen Dodd, Gavin Thompson. Hear the cries of your poor people, O God, and in your mercy. God, our beginning and our end, help us to serve you faithfully in all that you entrust to us, that when we come to the end of our earthly days, we may be found worthy to receive your heavenly treasure and enter into the joy of your eternal presence. Remember your good and faithful servants of every age, those who have kept the faith in times of persecution, those who have built up the community of faith in this place. And remember those members of St. James who have since passed, who we remember this week. With the saints on earth and the saints in glory, we raise our prayers to you. Hear the cries of your poor people, O God, and in your mercy. And we pray for Ukraine. God of peace and justice, we pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. We pray for those with power over war and peace, for wisdom, discernment and compassion to guide their decisions. Above all, we pray for all your precious children at risk and in fear that you may hold and protect them. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Almighty God, you have promised to hear our prayers. Grant that what we have asked in faith be made by your grace received through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are the body of Christ. The Spirit is with us. 
The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to set before you, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. And through your goodness we have this wine to set before you. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. Lord, we please accept the sacrifice we offer you. Our drop given between times. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. Oh, 
thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. All glory and honor be yours, always and everywhere. Mighty Creator, ever-living God, we give you thanks and praise for your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who by the power of your Spirit was born of Mary and lived as one of us. By his death on the cross and rising to a new life, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing.
Merciful God, we thank you for these gifts of your creation, this bread and wine. And we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, and again, giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Therefore, we do as our Saviour has commanded, proclaiming his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. And looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup his one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit, unite us in the body of your Son, and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. With home and in home, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father Amen. in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As this broken bread was once many grains, which have been gathered together and made one bread, 
so may your church be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed.
Gracious God, we thank you that in this sacrament you assure us of your goodness and love. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving and help us to grow in love and obedience that we may serve you in the world and finally be brought to that table where all your saints feast with you forever. Father, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord, send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work your praise and glory. Amen. Will you please be seated? We welcome those who are worshipping with us this morning on the live stream. And for those of you that have run the race that was so clearly set before you in order to be here, I draw your attention to the Institute Seminar, Women in Leadership, 
which takes place at 2.30 this afternoon, either in person in St. James Hall or via live stream. Details for online registration are in the service booklet. We will be offering a requiem in thanksgiving for the life, love and service of Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II at 6.30 p.m. this Wednesday, 21st of September. And a reminder and indeed encouragement to show your support for the bicentenary dinner, which is to be held at the Fullerton Hotel on Friday, 7th of October. Yes, tickets are $350, but a portion of that price is directed as a tax-deductible donation to the Organ Appeal. We have extended the closing date by an extra week or so. As you're well aware, much of our planned bicentenary celebrations during the last couple of years have been curtailed as a result of COVID, so please seriously consider supporting what will be a wonderful event. And we thank the St. James Foundation for its hard work and generous stewardship of its resources. This week, the parish received distributions from both the building and music foundations, and details of the breakup are listed in the service book. All other notices printed in the book I commend to you. So will you please stand?
God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the church, the king, the commonwealth, and all humankind, peace and concord, and to us and all his servants, life everlasting. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the, In the name, name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen.